Welcome back to the McCann Dogs Podcast, Season 4, Episode 14. And today we need to talk about Instructor Carol. We are excited. This is our first guest star coming on the podcast since uh, in the last couple of years, at least. We have uh, renovated a little bit in our studio. We now have a setup where we can have a third person on, and we might even get a setup for a fourth person. If you're watching us on the podcast video, you'll see we've made a few changes to our studio here here because we were growing and we wanted to be able to bring you guys more interesting speakers and more interesting topics. So on that note, today we have Instructor Swanee, Instructor Hi, Christine, and we also have Instructor Carol. Morning, everybody. Hi, Carol. <laughs> so nice to have you here on the podcast. And if you are a fan of our YouTube channel or an in-person student, you will know Instructor Carol very well. She is a very central instructor in our organization. And we love that because the creativity that comes out of this woman is quite brilliant and quite amazing. And it still stops me in my tracks sometimes when I think <laughs> of all of the creative ideas you come up with for your dog training. So welcome, Carol. Thank you for coming on. And Thank we, you, we didn't even have to bribe Carol. We were really worried. We we're like, oh my gosh, who's going to want to be on our podcast? That's and we were, you know, coming up with bribes and all that. But uh, Carol freely, oh, of her it, own leaving. free will, her own free will said, yes, I'll come on. Oh my God. See, you should have held out for I better. Held out. You could have had it's, wine and chocolate. And- it's exciting. However, it's a little nerve wracking too. I'm much better. If you know me in YouTube, I'm much better when I have a dog and I'm, my hands I'm working my dog, and uh, so it's a little nerve-wracking. I have no dog. Something else to focus on, right? (laughs) Something else that that everybody's probably watching the dog anyways, because, of course, the dogs always upstage us with how cute they are. Mm. Well, it is so nice to have you on here, and I'm excited to chat today. So one of the things that I wanted to do was help our audience, and, of course, that'll be our YouTube audience audience as well, and a lot of our um, students from in-house and online classes, I wanted to help them understand where instructor Carol came from because you have by far one of the more interesting origin stories as an instructor at McCann Dogs. So um, first off, you might not even know the answer to this because you you, you often don't, <laughs> but how long have you been with us at McCann's? I don't know. I don't, you know. I don't know how long I've been married. People say, when did you graduate from school? I, I don't remember times, but probably 25 years that I started yeah. as a student. I think that that's probably about right because you predate me and I'm about 23, 24 years now. So, and interestingly, you did not start with us with a dog. Tell us about your first pet. Well, I desperately wanted a dog. I didn't have one as a child, but I knew uh, I wanted one and had said that to my husband when we were going out. And um, when we actually got married, his family had never had dogs. And he just, the thought of dog hair, he was just, I can't have a dog. But he knew I desperately wanted one. So I guess he heard... uh, a radio show or TV or something, but they talked about potbelly pigs. So he said, let's get a potbelly pig. I'm Uh like, I want a dog, (laughs) not a pig. So he says, no, no, they say they can do anything a dog can do. So I did some research and, um, we decided, uh, we'll, we'll go and look at them. And we got Fred, who is a, a rescue and 10 months old, little potbelly pig. And I think he showed that pigs can do anything a dog can do. I mm. think you are absolutely <laughs> right. Did. And that's interesting because I didn't realize that he was 10 months old when you got him. I assumed, I guess all this time, I assumed that you got him as a tiny little pup. What do they call potbelly pig, pig, pigs? A piglet. A piglet. Oh, that makes so much more sense than pup. <laughs> No, um, we went to look at piglets and it was, you know, probably the same for everybody getting a puppy, overwhelming to make this choice and, you know, are we ready for this commitment? It was huge. And um, my husband and I were talking, which one do you like? And um, I said, well, maybe the little gray one. And he said, well, it looks like a Brillo pad. (laughs) So, and none of them really resonated, but I said, the one I really liked was one that was older, that uh, the breeder was great. They spent time with us, introduced us to all the pigs they had, and I really liked them. And my husband said, why don't you see if they'll part with him? So I called the breeder and um, I thought, I said to my husband, there's no way, you know, he's older, they won't want to part with them. Well, he'd been returned, the family couldn't handle him. Okay. So he'd gone mm. back to the breeder and she said, the problem is no one wants older ones, everybody wants the puppy or the piglet. Um, so she was fantastic. They, um, 
they said they'd had trouble with them. And uh, she said, look, try it. And if it's not working out, you know, bring them back. We'll take them. And uh, then we can look at either if there's still a piglet from the litter. Great. But she said, probably not. But we'd bump up on the list for the next one. And we took Fred and never, never looked back. Looked back. And that does not surprise me one bit because it definitely one of the amazing qualities about you is that I've never seen you give up on anything. You're extremely <laughs> determined. I've seen you come in and learn all sorts of new things and pick up all sorts of new information in training dogs. And I'm sure back then in training pigs as well. So I can't imagine you bringing Fred home at 10 months and then deciding it was too much work for you. That's just not who you are. <laughs> it scare me. It's like, a, I'm sure every first time puppy owner, right? It's a yeah. lot. And Oh, no doubt. And that was your first pet. It was even, you know, I laugh now when, in, when we have students in class or online and they talk about how sometimes through the day, there's a certain time where their pop sort of goes like wild and... I sort of laugh because I didn't know like zoomies or puppy burns at the time. (laughs) And I remember being on the floor reading the newspaper and Fred was hanging around. My husband was sitting in a chair. It was in the evening. And all of a sudden, Fred's standing there looking at me. He literally went straight up. Did a 180, like at 100 miles an hour, and then started running. But it wasn't just like trotting. He was running (laughs) full speed one way and then the other. And we're both looking and I'm like, is it a seizure? (laughs) <laughs> what well, what's going on and now you know people ask it's like well of course it's you know it's a, a puppy burn but oh my i gosh. had no idea so and obviously there's pig burns yes. so piggy that burns. is hilarious and you know what i actually just watched a documentary on netflix about cats and i'm not really a cat person but i found it fascinating regardless and i did not know that cats also have zoomies or frap oh. fr- frenetic random activity periods and now i know that pigs have them too <laughs> swanee did you know that pigs had zoomies i i i didn't i didn't I can, i'm just thinking of their little hooves running around and uh yeah i think that would be quite cute oh, you know my goodness you know my I, one of my huge regrets is that I never put that on command because, oh. of course, I didn't know it then. Plus, it was pretty scary when it happened for the first several times before I decided, <laughs> OK, he's not turned, um, you know, it's not ra- He's not rabid. It's not, <laughs> it's not an illness. Uh, so it was um, but it, with my Great Dane, because it was fun to watch a, f- you know, a hundred pound dog yes. have the zoobies. And uh, so that I put on command, but I didn't think about it with Fred because it was hilarious. I do remember Earl, the Great Dane that you're talking about. I do remember Earl doing the zoomies and it was quite the sight to see. And he was always good at not taking anybody out in his pursuit. You did a great job training that. Yeah, I trained no touching people so he could run full speed. I still remember when you and I were, you know, when I was first in one of the more advanced classes and I remember Robbie, instructor Robbie being in there and Robbie saying, can you let him run? Have have him have a puppy burn because it was fun to watch uh-huh. oh yeah would stand off to the side and i would tell him go wild how could you not love watching that that is so fun <laughs> so that brings me to another talking point that i have today and earl was a very accomplished obedience dog which doesn't happen a lot with that breed so you and swanee have that in common you've both had some breeds and done some amazing things with them that are not traditionally easy to accomplish so talk about earl's um and Carol is so humble that she might not even remember all the accolades that Earl has or might not be willing to brag about them. But tell us about Earl's obedience career. He uh, he did great. Um, I had never really, – so I love training. I was just addicted, right? So anything I could do. And I started the formal obedience and – liked, um, you know, working on the precision. And uh, I know Deb McCann always talked about, you know, formal obedience is one of the best ways, strongest ways to build a relationship with your dog. Yeah. And I'd agree with that so much. Yeah. Um, And it's not easy, right? And that's part of building the relationship. It's not, it's not that, you know, when you throw a disc for most dogs, not all, I've had one that wasn't naturally rewarding, but there's a lot of natural reward in running. And, um, but so I started with Earl and through class and we had a lot of fun and I decided I would try trialing. Mm -hmm. And I went in thinking I've got to get it right because Earl was not the smartest dog in the world, right? <laughs> uh, and I thought if he doesn't get it the first time, I think it will fall out, a lot will fall apart. So he was, we did, I think, four runs, um, and he was perfect in all four, except on one exercise he needed 
one second command, just the confidence to go get his articles. So I was just so dejected. And then, but it was the best thing that ever happened because things did fall apart. They weren't cemented. Mm -hmm. So I went through and really learned how do I communicate with him? How do I make it fun so that he can do this? And I was under uh, one misconception. When I started, there's like the top in Canada, but it was all based on how many trials you did. So you got points. So it, did count whether you scored well, but you could just keep doing more trials. So I thought, okay, the person that's willing to drive to Thunder Bay in December um, <laughs> and drive everywhere through the year. That is dedication. Does and spend all that money. Mm-hmm. Well, so you can buy your way to top dog in Canada with money and time. But what I found was no, doing those exercises and in that formal environment over and over again Mm -hmm. requires that bond, that training, um, and not just sort of train it and then just go do it. So uh, I really enjoyed, I got right into it. I wasn't necessarily looking to campaign or, you know, be in the top dogs in Canada, but I was addicted and I loved weekend trips with Earl, um, sometimes with Fred too, tagging along. (laughs) And, um, you know, Fred, the odd time got to compete in obedience or whatever, but, um, so fun. Yeah. So it was just great to travel around with my dog and learning and meeting people. And it, it taught me so much about training. Yeah, I bet it did. I remember all those classes so, so fondly. We talk about them often, eh, Swanee? Yes, like we talking do. about we do. being yes. in Deb McCann's late night obedience classes. And they were late night too. Oh, yes. <laughs> Definitely yes. McCann after. After dark. Sometimes we'd be there till one thirty in the morning, yep. and I used to get up at four thirty for work. Oh my gosh! Right. Oh my goodness! Those days, back in yes. those days, I remember being there six days a week and being there late most evenings, and just loving it. Like mm-hmm. I couldn't wait to get to the end of the work day training other people's dogs, so that I could get into Deb McCann's classes and train my dogs. And it was it was such a great learning experience. And you must have had so much amazing learning happened for you when you were training Earl because you would have had to think outside the box so much. Yeah. I remember Debbie sort of laughing at me. And I I mean, it was interesting when I got Fred, because when I went through class, instructors would always say, how are you going to do this? Because I'd done some training up front with Fred. It was interesting because I'd done a bit, called McCann's who had just opened the new facility. Mm -hmm. And they said, oh no, we can't take a pig it will make too much noise. And I'm like, I remember, I remember the discussions. I remember I hadn't met you yet, but I remember the discussions. Yes. (laughs) And it was funny because I'm thinking, how will anyone hear my little pig over those dogs? I'd seen dog training, um, (laughs) when, um, a relative had gotten a dog and it was somewhere else and it was chaos. I couldn't imagine McCann's being the way it was. So I'm thinking there's all this chaos. How would you hear the pig? Um, now also pigs will squeal at the same, uh, decibel level as an aircraft engine. Oh, oh my goodness. Yes. Oh my goodness. Yes. So, um, now, I did not hear that with Fred a lot. I know the first time I took him to the vet again, I'd done some handling in prep for the vet just thinking, I need to make this positive. When I finished the vet said, you've just dip- dis- disappointed everyone in our clinic. And of course I'm aghast. I've done something wrong. And I'm like, why? And he said, because they're all waiting for the scream. And I'm oh like, what scream? They said, we normally can't even touch a pig because they panic. You know, they're not, they're prey animals. And uh, I had done some work and so he was quiet. So um, I did a few privates and, um, you know, there was lots of controversy about should I get into class or not. And um, I wasn't around for this, but Swan, do you remember that? I think that. there were yes. some yelling yes. and some tears. <laughs> <laughs> so, and Deb McCann, you know, very sternly an orientation night when I was just a gog, right? No dogs there, but just watching the instructors. Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh, the, the look at those dogs, the way they looked at their owners, the relationship. So um, Deb, I went up to say how impressed I was. And Deb said, now look, you know, Fred's going to come in. He's going to make a lot of noise. We're probably going to have to escort you out of the building sort of thing. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, I'll take that risk. And uh, Fred came in. Everybody's too busy with their dogs. Not a single dog or person ever even noticed him. Wow. Mm-hmm. And then, so we started class and... Um, you know, sort of never looked back. It was interesting as we went along. I remember the one Deb said, um, I I was doing something different and she's like, that's, I think just the way it's going to be. Yeah. But with Fred, it was so, um, the training was all pretty much the exact same, but everybody said, how will you do this with Fred? And I would have to think about it. But in hindsight, it was pretty 
much the same as the dog, but with Earl, he was, I got him, he was a rescue, he's already 10 months, you know, almost 100 pounds, Mm -hmm. so big and not as smart, not food motivated. So it caused me a lot more problem solving. Isn't uh, that funny? Just yes. thinking about how I'm going to train this with Earl. So he, both of them taught me so much. Oh my goodness. Oh. Swanee, I want to, uh, I'm really curious to know if you think back to these discussions about whether or not we should allow a pig into our classes <laughs> and, and how much that was going to distract or not the other dogs. What side of the fence were you on? Well, I, I was thinking, let's let's try it. Let's let's bring bring Fred in and Carol, and because uh, we didn't know Carol then either, we had no idea. Like Carol was such a great person, uh, mm-hmm. so you know she definitely, you know, we definitely uh, just didn't know what we were getting into. So um, yeah, I, I definitely wanted to see him in class, and I was amazed how the dogs just accepted him. Yeah, like the dogs, you'd see some dogs come in and they'd kind of air scent, but then it's like, oh, okay, I guess that's normal for this room, like. That's yeah, so like, amazing. I remember being in open class with Fred, with um, my Malinois, and, uh, you know, doing a sit-stay beside him. And, uh, you know, Sabre was just, yep, that's just the way classes are. There there might be a pig in the class this week. Who knows what's coming next week? <laughs> Fabulous. And what a great distraction yes, for our yes. young dogs to be training. Anybody who doesn't know, open is the um, middle level of, obe- of obedience. So this is already dog. These are already dogs and a pig who have accomplished quite a bit in obedience mm-hmm. and they're ready for the next stage. There's some jump work and some retrieve work and all sorts of really fun stuff in open. And off leash. The dogs, yes. the dogs and the pigs are off okay. leash at that yeah. program. So everyone has to you know be able to ignore ignore each other and, uh, you know, hang out with their owner. Yeah. <laughs> that was one thing I think that was, I think everybody's surprised with, um, you know, the first week there's so much going on and there's other dogs. So the dogs didn't pay any attention, but throughout Fred's life, he rarely got the attention of another dog. Um, you know, for the most part, Dogs just didn't care. Um, there were a couple of dogs. One was funny. He was another instructor with a Weimaraner. And this Weimaraner couldn't function with Fred around, which was so different. And I said, look, why don't we go out for a hike and um, just let him get used to Fred? Mm-hmm. And it was funny because you'd think the Weimaraner with the hunting instinct would want to kill Fred, but he didn't. Jake was in love. He would come up and he would lick Fred's face. And Fred <laughs> was like, what are you doing? And when we went out for the walk, it was funny. Fred was carrying a ball. And he dropped the ball. Jake actually saw that. He went running back about 50 feet, got the ball, and brought it back and dropped it at Fred's feet. Oh, my oh, wow. goodness. That's hilarious. Just, oh, so it wasn't oh. a, you know, uh, I need to kill you. I saw very little of that, maybe because Fred's in a collar, like the other dogs, mm-hmm. and not running and screaming, which would kick off that free yes. drive. And, mm-hmm. you know, I still remember one student in grade three, week four, she said, oh, my gosh, she says, I didn't even realize he was a pig. <laughs> she said, I was so busy with my own dog and we were sitting at opposite end. She says, I just thought he was an ugly bull terrier. Oh, <laughs> oh my goodness. That is wonderful. I love that so yes. much. So we, um, uh, of course, you're our resident pig expert. So I know that you've had some private lessons with other pot-bellied pigs and things like that as the years have gone on. When was the last time you worked with a pig? It's probably been over a year. It was pretty consistent, but I haven't seen one for a while. I sort of, I was thinking that the other day. I sort of miss seeing the odd pig coming in and working with them. So. Yeah, isn't that funny? And we had a puppy essentials class that I remember there was a pig in. In as well. Did you teach that one? No, that one was, I think, before me, okay. which was why, and I guess it went very badly. The pig screamed, uh-huh. so that terrified mm. people. It got the dogs either scared or ready to kill that instinct. Um, so that's where the, the no, it won't work because the last one didn't. Oh, mm, yes. interesting. Interesting. So this was based on history that we were making these assumptions. But of course, Carol, very <laughs> determined, very, very determined. And that is, I mean, your previous occupation. You haven't always been full time with us. Um, you've retired from. Tell us about your previous occupation a little bit. What did you do? I was at Defasco. I started off as a mechanical engineer in maintenance mm-hmm. and uh, became a foreman and then a, a manager in engineering and then a manager in maintenance. Um, in uh, the primary manufacturing end and loved it. And of course, 
whether it's maintenance or engineering, it's a lot of problem solving. Yes. I remember Marty commenting on my training skills and it's, it's the same as I do for design. You need to break the problem down. So it just, and shaping for me, um, I'd actually shaped before anybody told me what it was. When I first had mm. Fred, I wanted to teach him to retrieve and he had no natural chase drive. So I just took a disc and went over to a school and put it on the ground. And when he looked at this weird thing that I just dropped down, I rewarded him. Um, I did that a few times and then, you know, then he picked it up and then within about 10 minutes, I threw it about 10 feet and he'd go and get it and bring it right back. Fabulous. And I remember a gentleman with a bunch of shepherds uh, working on the other side and he came over and he says, I've never seen anything like that. <laughs> and, uh, but Fred was so operant um, and so just loved working. You what know, kind of treats did you use for Fred? I started off with Shreddy's. Oh. oh, yeah, I was, I would come to the school actually the couple of weeks before I just wanted to make sure he was comfortable around the dogs. So I would, um, I brought the truck. I sat in the tailgate with Fred and is anytime a person went by with the dog, I gave him a shreddy. Hmm, so fabulous. just create this positive association. Don't, you know, get overexcited. Don't get scared. And, um, so I did shreddies and then a lot of times kibble. So I'd sort of move to that. You have to watch not like dogs, not a lot of salt, right. Okay, but, uh, I would use some dog treats and, uh, pig he loved food so i didn't have to use anything too crazy so um i would use kibble the odd time some carrots you know mm -hmm. we have students that use carrots yep. or some vegetables and so i would sort of mix it up that way and fabulous this is so fun and and for anybody anybody listening that um that setup sitting on the tailgate and rewarding as things happen and people and dogs go by is fabulous socialization. Remember always that socialization is about exposure and not necessarily interaction. And a lot of the times we make our, we make, we create problems for ourselves by creating dogs who are obsessed with other dogs or other people by allowing them to interact ad nauseum. So this is a really good solution from instructor Carol for those of you who have young dogs that you're trying to socialize. It's so nice to think about that as exposure and rewarding confidence confidence and rewarding calmness in a lot of cases versus allowing those um, interactions that might eventually become obsessive or might go the wrong way. And now you have a problem. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So letting Fred go up to every dog that uh, he saw might have resulted in something not so nice happening and could have set things back. That is excellent. Excellent point. I used to like patting Fred. He was all <laughs> bristly and he, he, he just felt so different to pat and uh, sort yeah. of like a hairless cat, right? right? You're not quite sure where to touch, but you want to touch. And he would grow <laughs> so much more. Is it bristles? Is that bristles, what they call them? Like, yes, in yeah. the winter, he was all bristly. And then in the, in the summer, he would lose his bristles. Did you ever have to shave him? Or I did. It was funny. His bristles were quite um, interesting. Um when in the winter it was cool because they were long and like the wild boar, he had that sort of look. But of course, it's flat. And um, it was funny because if you talk to him, the hairs along the center of the back would go up. Oh. Mm. So he'd get happy, the tail would wag, and oh. those hairs came up. Oh my gosh. And they'd go quiet and they would fold back down. And then you'd say, hey, Fred. And they'd pop back mm -hmm. up. And it was kind of cool. And then he would lose them. It was weird how he lost them. Those center ones that were the longest were actually the first ones to come out in the spring. They would fall out. Oh. Mm. So um, he'd have a reverse mohawk, which looked really weird. <clears throat> and it was funny. You could pull, um, sort of like stripping a terrier, but in the winter, you could pull all you wanted. You could get vice grips. It wasn't coming out. But in the summer, they'd pull almost like a porcupine quill, just pull right out. Oh, wow. But you sort of had to wait till they were ready. So we'd have this reverse mohawk. So the ones I decided, I'm just going to shave them. Uh, of course, I know nothing, right? Never had a head before. Um, one of our instructors came in who was also a groomer and said, you shaved Fred. And I said, yes. And she said, you know, when we shave a dog, we don't go right to the skin. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, sorry, Fred. It seemed to bother him, which was good. Right. But uh, <laughs> good news to uh, to carry forward with for sure. And so, he needed sunscreen. Oh right. my goodness! Oh, right, yes, yeah. so all over few, or just just, in just really his nose um, okay. and the head, but especially around the nose. I think some dogs similar if they've got a light color. Yeah. Um, you know, I sort of learned that the hard way. He we were out hiking. He would hike 20 miles on a weekend with me, and uh, hadn't did have a sunscreen on and one day pig. the next day he was oh oh, oh my goodness healing. yeah so if there's a lack of pigment there that'll often burn i know with with tollers that that's a common question that that people will ask or will talk about is that tollers actually even though they have 
more flesh colored noses, it's still a pigmented nose. So it doesn't tend to burn. But if you have a breed with a butterfly type nose or with no pigments, then sunscreen is a really nice option. And for our pigs as well. Yeah. I'm curious about uh, the intelligence factor of the pig. So I know that they're they're reputedly absolutely brilliant and Earl, you, you know, self-admittedly <laughs> was not the most brilliant, but you have had many dogs since Earl, including Border Collies, which are rumored as the most intelligent, sometimes after the poodle, but sometimes before them too, depending on who you're talking to. So how would you compare the intelligence of, say, your smartest Border Collie with Fred? Nowhere close. Really, eh? Yeah. Yeah. Now they say, wow. you know, for all of the reading, again, each study is a little different. For the most part, they say pigs are the third smartest uh, intelligent animal. Um, so first would be uh, chimps, then dolphins, then pigs. Wow. Which I think there's so many misnomers about pigs when I got one. Um, you know, the fact that they're dirty. We actually got one because they're so much cleaner than dogs. And my husband really liked, that was why he wanted a pig. Um, you know, they do roll in mud in a field, but if there was clean water they would take the clean water. Yeah. They have mm-hmm. to roll in that mud because otherwise they're like dogs. They only perspire through their feet. Um, they'd burn. So they have to roll to stay alive Mm -hmm. and they need water or mud but they rarely have enough fresh water so they roll in the mud because of that but they're very very fastidious animals okay Um, they are intelligent which i think a lot of people don't know Mm -hmm. i i was unaware of that um even when they eat it's interesting they um will choose the freshest vegetables oh so obviously sometimes they don't have a choice but given a choice pigs will choose the freshest Mm -hmm. uh, available food uh other than humans, they're the only other species that can become alcoholics. Oh, oh wow. I'm not, yeah. I'm not sure who found that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How did they go about determining that? Right, and yes. who volunteered their pig? So, I'm thinking some college student um, oh, dear. decided got right, some money yes. for his thesis or something oh, or study. And, yeah. So, um, but, and I mean, the one thing that is true is they are, you know, I'll say stubborn. I, I always dissuade people from that when people say their dogs are stubborn because, you know, I would say people are the same. We do what's rewarding you got to it. us, mm-hmm. right? You got so it. So we know we should eat better. We know we should, you know, drink water. We know we should do all that we should work out. But we do what's rewarding. Um, and animals are the same. Mm-hmm. So that's, you know, that's where training now. Um, pigs don't necessarily, like some dogs, have a real urge to please people. Uh, but they can be, they were very, Fred was very operant. So from a training, and, and Fred taught me a lot that's applied with my Jack Russell who people call stubborn, Mm -hmm. you know, they're strong willed um, and they want what they want, which are all dogs, but it sort of got me into, you can't fight a pig. I learned that. Can't fight a pig. (laughs) Um, You know, they're, they're stubborn, um, you know, you know, just, they're just going to dig in and fight. Uh, But what I found was if I can set things up Mm -hmm. so that they want what I want, Oh man, it's like night and day. So Amazing. things like not running through a do- an open door, you know, I could battle forever. But if I set it up so they just can't get out, my foot's on a line. Um, and when they don't barge out, I reward them or I reward them by letting them out. Now they want what I want. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And now stopping at the door is rewarding. Well, man, you can train that because I do find jacks are great. Maybe not as intelligent, but they are pheno- usually phenomenal problem solvers. They just aren't looking to solve our problems. <laughs> so you got to twist around. But yeah. I, you know, I love jocks. I like that because they are logical that way. Yeah. And and as the human in the relationship, us standing on our ground and saying, you know what, you're going to do this my way. I would say that turns the tables and makes it the human being stubborn versus the dog actually being stubborn. So um, let's talk about some of your other dogs then. So Fred is great. I could talk about Fred all day, but we are a dog training podcast. So. <laughs> So maybe we should talk about dogs a little bit. And you have had many different breeds then. So tell us about the breeds you've had. So I started out with the Potbelly Pig, went to a Great Dane, who Mm -hmm. is the dog I'd always wanted, you know, the dog of my dreams, Mm -hmm. um, and certainly fulfilled that. Um, And then I wanted to to learn, so I went for a small dog. So I went from a 150-pound, four-foot dog to a nine-inch Jack Russell Terrier. (laughs) Um, And Dell was my favorite. I sometimes call him my loser dog. Um, These guys know um, he uh, had a neurological 
biological chemical imbalance. Mm-hmm. Um, and at the time, so he, I used to joke, he's either, you know, insane or he's the only one to know that space aliens are here to suck our brain. <laughs> um, <laughs> he knew the truth. Yeah. Because for about 90% of the time, he was terrified for his life. He couldn't function. Uh, so it was really hard. And at first I thought it was normal fear, right? So mm-hmm. I needed to gain confidence and wasn't really working. So then I decided, okay, behavior management. So I, um, you know, I, uh, taught, I shaped him to relax. I, um, did a lot of, you know, associating sense with, with, um, relaxation and, um, did a lot of work. Um, uh, finally, um, needed to look at some pharmaceuticals as well. Mm-hmm. Didn't want to go there. And I was convinced, you know, dog trainer, I can train anything, but like people, some people, are not wired right. And right. Fred or uh, Dell taught me a lot that, you know, he didn't want to be afraid. He wanted to do things. So sometimes I think, you know, as much as I knew mental illness was an illness, you think, ah, sometimes you did this thing, suck it up. Yeah. But when I saw him struggle, um, and just the way it was totally irrational. It wasn't anything real that ever scared him. It was just in that brain. Mm-hmm. Uh, so between the behavior management um, and medication, he lived a reasonably normal life. Uh, he was phenomenal. You know, with Earl, um, we competed in obedience, and he ended up in the top working dogs in Canada, and he taught me so much. Then with Dell, and everybody said, oh, you're going to learn so much about behavior. And I used some words I shouldn't use and told him, I don't want to learn about behavior. I want to train. <laughs> right. uh, but he taught me so, so much that I apply to this day with with dogs that have fear issues or aggression mm-hmm. issues. And um, he did extremely well, uh, won the regionals in Canada, went to nationals. Um, you just In knew, agility. In agility. Yeah. You just knew that any given day – the space aliens might be there. Oh my goodness! And, uh, <laughs> you know that was going to affect him, but he, you know, really taught me again something so much new and introduced me to a new sport again. Fabulous. Mm-hmm. So, um, what were your go-to <laughs> tactics then when he would suddenly go from being fairly fairly normal and 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 easy to identify problems with to suddenly? thinking about the space aliens. What were your tactics? So initially my tactics taught me a lot about pressure. Um, I still remember with instructor Robbie saying, watch this. I pulled treats out of my pocket, opened my hand and Dell tucked his tail. And it was, you're going to ask something me. And some of that was trained because our instinct when a dog is afraid and certainly it worked well with Fred, uh, less so with Earl because Earl was a rescue as well. So had some confidence issues up front with Fred pull up food. And Fred was quite, even though he's piggy, he was very confident for a prey animal and he had huge trust in me. But with Dell, he was wired wrong. So with his fear, he couldn't overcome it. So when I tried to say, you know, look, I'm going to distract you with toy or food, he couldn't handle that pressure. Okay. So it made it worse. So I learned, okay, pressure is something very important with those dogs. Yeah. <laughs> so I, um, uh, you know, more I learned um, that in some cases I wasn't going to be able to change that at the time. So don't get stressed. Don't add that stress to him. Don't try and, you know, yes, I'd like to go do an agility run, but he's not going to be able to do it right now. He's not in that mode. Uh, yeah, he just can't. Um, so taking the pressure off. I also learned, you know, same thing. If I got too excited doing agility, um, you know, anybody that does gambles, I love that, right? And he was so good at, I could just sit in this chair and send him through a course left, right? He was so good. But I got so pumped because I love this and I knew I could kick butt. Mm -hmm. So all that adrenaline would actually shut him down. So I needed to control my emotions to help him um, and be patient. You know, it's my, my, one of my mantras. Um, When I go to the line at Worlds with my Border Collie, I have a little cardboard card and I have lucky to be here. Yeah, so I love Dell, that. I've seen I that say, from you. Yeah. Lucky to be here. You know, don't be, don't, don't worry about winning. Don't worry if I can't do all the runs. I'm just lucky that, wow, I'm able to go compete in this and have fun and be a part of this world. What an amazing attitude. I love that. And that sets you up so well to be able to be at events and enjoy it and enjoy your dog. And that was a wayward dog jumping through the studio and knocking the yes. microphone there. <laughs> enjoy your dog and enjoy the event and not put so much pressure on yourself to be the best there, but to be present and to do the best you possibly can. Mm-hmm. That's amazing. I love that. Change one of my things to, instead of thinking about the big Q, qualifying Mm -hmm. in a given sport or given run, uh, because that puts so much pressure on us, um, that 
I care about, I want people to say, wow, what a team, um, or that dog is excellent. Mm-hmm. So, you know, people worry, oh, I'll knock the bar. My dog will miss a contact. My dog's not going to hit that signal. Um, you know, it's like, you know, when you're watching, you you don't even notice those things. You say, wow, look at that dog. Yeah. That's amazing. Or, and I've had so many people, um, last year at Worlds after freestyle, you know, I've, and through so many competitions, people come up and say, I love watching you and your dog. You're just the connection you have with them. And that's the team. biggest compliment mm-hmm. anybody could give me. Absolutely. Yes. So let's talk a little bit about, um, about disc because you've alluded to it a couple of times now and we haven't talked about that yet. So this is your current favorite sport. I'm it guessing is, is di- disc work with your dogs, which is, um, frisbee sort of discs i know frisbee is a brand name but uh just in case anybody doesn't know what we mean when we say disc i guess flying disc (laughs) is is the uh the the accepted term so tell us about the sport of disc tell us a little bit about that i love it um i sort of fell on it by accident i've actually never other than i started actually teaching fred to retrieve with a disc Mm -hmm. i've never really done disc with my dogs i was always worried about injuries Mm -hmm. Uh, so i had never done it and i was at a fly ball tournament with uh thorpe and uh uh, in our gift bag, there was a disc, and he was young at the time. And I thought, well, I'm and Thorpe is your border collie, border who is one hundred percent stone deaf, he as is. well as being a like, five time world champion is, of discs. Yes. So very well trained dog who cannot hear <laughs> and can still get out there and kick butt. He sure <laughs> can, even at ten years old. Yeah. So I um, started doing a couple of little tiny tosses for my knees, and it was going well. And then I was doing like ten feet, and it was like this is kind of cool. And I thought I'd like to see a disc competition. So I went to one, and I also had Newman. Uh, Newman Bing, my Parson Russell. Uh, and it was funny because um, Newman was, uh, as much as he was a Parson Russell, which is essentially a Jack Russell, he never read that manual. And he was a rescue. I didn't get him till he was almost four. And he had zero chase drive, no interest in toys. So we went to desk and Newman, of course, no. But I thought, you know, even if my dogs, you know, aren't good at disc when I get to a trial, because I'd never seen one, I know they're not going to embarrass me. Mm -hmm. They're going to represent me well. They're going to be well behaved. They're going to work with me. They're going to be focused on me. If they can't catch a disc, who cares? Newman, of course, didn't catch a disc. Uh, (laughs) Thorpe was amazing. He actually won every round the first time we went out that we played. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was a sport called disc freestyle, which Mm -hmm. I hadn't signed up for because I didn't even know what it was. And you used, at this organization, you used five discs. It was done to music. And the first time I saw it, it's like, I want to do this. And there's a second round. So I went up and I said, do I need to have like five matching discs? And they said, yes. So it's like, okay, well, I only have two discs and they don't match. So I had to buy discs. And then I said, you have to have music. And they said, yes. And somebody was there and they said, oh, if you don't have your music, I've got tons. What's your song? I said, well, I don't actually have one. Well, what speed do you need? I just need music because they say I need music. (laughs) So I pick anything. And I went out with no routine and just threw discs. And then on the way home, it's like, by next week, I'm going to have a routine. Mm -hmm. And Thorpe knew so many tricks and he was so eager to work with me. So, and I could do short throws. So I did a lot of, I did a skit. He was a bad dog and it was funny. The next week I went to uh, another uh, competition and I, um, starts off, he's walking on two legs beside me, healing on two legs, music, you know, really high. Mm -hmm. And then I send him around me. I go to throw my music. It's like the needle scratched and he drops to the ground. Doesn't go for the disc. And then I looked at Jesse and it was so funny because everybody watching went, oh, oh, so they bought right (laughs) into this. You fooled them all. I go over to pick up the disc and I bend over to pick it up and Thorpe comes running and knocks my butt. (laughs) I throw the disc and we start our routine. So it was funny. The judge from the previous week was playing that week and he came up and he said, why did you not use that last week? Why did you do what you did? (laughs) that last week i'd never seen this board uh, (laughs) oh my goodness so the fact that we had so many tricks made up for me not really having a great throw or only knowing backhand uh but from that moment on i was hooked and thorpe has continued to wow learn and i just love it that it doesn't shock me at all that you came back a week later (laughs) and just absolutely (laughs) nailed it so just um on this topic of disc you are putting on a disc seminar at our place at mccann dogs on uh, February 17th. So 19th. tell us 
February 19th. 19th. You're right. February 19th. It's the Sunday. Um, Tell us a little bit about that. There's two seminars, one in the morning, one in the evening, or one in the afternoon. Yes, I am excited. So we're going to have one because you're going to be working with me, Shannon. Yes, I'm excited to play along. Shannon and Amy, who are going to be uh, working with me, which is awesome. And we have a great group of people. In the morning, we've got a total introduction to DISC. Mm -hmm. Now, it can be for people who already know DISC, who maybe want to work on their throw, who have a dog that maybe comes back slowly, won't release the DISC, won't you know, carry the disc, they drop it. So it could be for troubleshooting, which I love because, um, you know, we've got a course, Reliable Retrieves, because, I mean, that's how Thorpe and I have gotten our championships. It's not necessarily that he's the fastest dog. Mm-hmm. There are dogs that are faster. There are younger dogs. Uh, but that reliable catch and that reliable bring back. And, you know, I can essentially have him hold a disc till I cue not. Mm-hmm. Um, he's not going to drop it early and he's going to release the second I ask. So that reliability. Uh, but then some of the people will be brand new, Mm -hmm. never touched a disc. And, you know, we'll be showing them how to throw um, and how to build that drive for their dog. Some of the dogs may have the drive. And then we're going to talk about how we prevent those problems from coming up where the dog's not going to drop the disc and just set them up to start. I'm hoping some of those people will get addicted like I did. Oh, Mm -hmm. and I have no doubt that some of them will. So um, this seminar, just to to preface this, it is full, but we do have audit spots. And I think we're still able to... Pretty much count on fairly unlimited audit spots yes. for both the morning and the afternoon. So if you're interested in learning, unfortunately, the participation spots went like that. Um, <laughs> however, there are lots of audit spots involved. So tell us what the afternoon session is going to be like. Yep, the afternoon and I'm also full, which was great. They filled the same day. Yeah. Wow. So we'll be doing more. Uh, the afternoon is introduction to freestyle. Again, no experience necessary. We had said if people did, that's great because we're going to work on some tricks so we can fine tune tricks if someone's got one of the ones we're working on or they will get them on a different one. If people are brand spanking new, we're going to teach the dogs things like how to catch the disc and jump over, Mm -hmm. um, how to do vaults, um, how to do flips. So a lot of disc Mm -hmm. tricks uh, that'll be fun. And again, no experience necessary. We're going to help people because a lot of what I want to do is build that great foundation rather than trying to do the finished product and we maybe hurt the dog we maybe hurt ourselves we may stress the dog how do we set them up so that it's going to go smoothly and reliably and everybody's going to have a good time and then you're going to be able to get out there and show off your freestyle routine so Car- carol are pigs allowed at the dis- <laughs> absolutely i'd love to have a pig man we'll, we'll bump them in you know and it's one of the things i remember uh starting out with youtube's um Ken did course me. I don't think he went for bribes. I think he coerced me into doing a video. And uh, we did it on disc. It was funny. One of the early ones we did was a footstall. And I've had so many people say they tried everything um, and that one resonated for them or that one was the only one to work. And those people that were willing to put in the steps and not stress their dog and not say, I've got to get it in a week, Mm -hmm. um, have just loved it. But that was some of the, all the feedback I got there was, you know what? I'm willing to do some more YouTube videos because if I can help people, that's awesome. Yeah, mm. absolutely. Tap into Carol's engineer brain so you can break down these problems into little bite-sized chunks and come out with a wonderful finished product at the end. That's just awesome. So yeah, if you're interested in learning some disc stuff from Carol, you can reach out to our office team and they'll be able to uh, secure you an audit spot. We also have a reliable retrieves for fun and exercise online dog training course that we'll be running again in the spring spring with instructor instructor carol at the head with that she'll be teaching as well if you're interested in disc there is no better person out there to learn mm-hmm. about disc from um so carol tell me just uh just to uh we're getting a little bit long on this episode but i've really enjoyed this <laughs> chat so just to wrap things up tell me about your current dogs now you've got three dogs i do i have um thorpe my my 10 year old border collie who is daf mm-hmm. who's just amazing uh we're doing um ra- or we're doing disc freestyle. We're doing freestyle uh, that I got into um, with uh, sort of COVID because there weren't the disc trials. So freestyle that is, tell us a little bit about so that. So traditionally other. freestyle is dancing with your dog and there's mm-hmm. some amazing people. I do not dance <laughs> and I am not going to dance. Uh, but so I've sort of done the skit premise. So, um, you know, I've been doing routines with him and, uh, you know, really enjoyed doing that. I'm working on a new one now, a baseball skit. So, where it involves a lot of um, different behaviors and coordinated moves between the two of us without 
dancing. Uh, so he's done it's pretend dancing. Well, <laughs> I also do a sport called rally free. It's like rally obedience, but it's freestyle moves. And that was interesting. I sort of got intrigued. I was just doing it for a little bit of fun with my young border collie, but I was sort of intrigued because you're not allowed to use verbal or not allowed to use signals. It's only verbals. And uh, my young border collie, the one day I uh, didn't have her and I put my older one into class and I was like, there's an extra twist here. Now, there is a category. People, is there not a category? Like, Thorpe shouldn't be penalized because he can't hear. But it's like, no, no, there is. But one, he's so good. So um, I've actually scored perfect scores in a sport where I can't use signals with a deaf dog. That's amazing. Interesting. That yes. is amazing. So yes. t- uh, it, I know everybody's going, wow. <laughs> so describe some of your signals that are so subtle that it's Thorpe who's picking up on them, but nobody else. Now, some are natural body language. So there's one where my dog's at my left or right and I want to do a 180 turn and they're going to turn so we both turn the same way mm-hmm. when I go to turn when I start the very much start the turn he already knows that means I'm going to turn and he turns so it's just natural so a number of them are natural body language um I do have one that's a little bit of a um about three steps before I stop I twitch my middle finger on the side closest to him, (laughs) like an eighth of an inch. When I stop, he knows he should turn. But of course, there's no Mm. signal. And realistically, people are always moving their fingers. Uh, So is that a signal? It could just be this quirk that I do that. (laughs) um, Then I do have a few facial. When I need him to leave my side, I basically say the word go because he can't hear, but he can, uh, I think, maybe feel the vibration, but he can see my mouth. So it's an accentuated go. And then I look at where I need him to go. So he can determine, is that a jump? Does he need to wrap a cone? Uh, I do one where I send him, but there's two cones. So he does a figure eight. But what I do is when he wraps one, he looks at me. I just look down. So he says, okay, I'm just going to keep going. Amazing. Um, so uh, w- my um, bow is a weird little poof, so that he sees my <laughs> tongue come out of my mouth. So people probably think I have facial tics on some of the, <laughs> the behaviors because my ex- my expression when I give the sound. So, uh, you know, when I need him to, when he's in front of me to turn and face away, I just do a big open mouth. <laughs> like I'm gasping for breath. Oh <laughs> my gosh. You know, and, uh, you know, so he's just done. So it's been fun figuring out these different cues no and yes. uh you know how do i do this so it's been a little bit extra extra challenge but dogs are amazing. so they amazing are, they yes. really are they're such masters of body language and this is proof of that like how could you ever how could you ever dispel this there, there's no way around <laughs> this he'll do things on the twitch of your finger which is absolutely fabulous yeah and then i have the burke who's mm-hmm. uh, actually just turned 10 last week uh he is um i got him when he was almost five he had been in a hoarding situation oh. he was removed because they weren't cared for then he he spent uh, quite a bit of time locked in a cage in an SPCA, then went through several homes, uh, then um, sort of got reunited back with people that knew him in the breeder. And I got him. And wow, he's been awesome. He is silly. He's part terrier, my mm-hmm. favorites. So he's uh, he's uh, extremely agile. So he, um, at DISC, he doesn't catch as well and doesn't have some of the same foundation, but uh, he's my wow dog. People yeah. just, you know, when they see him do some of the tricks and bouncing and he likes height, um, you know, he's just like soaring off my back and through the air. Uh, Burke makes some of the best noises you oh, will yes. ever hear. He is yes. very unique in the noises that he makes. Yes, yes. he's he's unique in many ways. And if he misses the desk, um, you sort of hear across the field, snap. You, know, you can hear him as people, but he's... Um, he has so much heart and, uh, you know, he's gotten better and better just this last year. I've had so many people remark where, you know, typically we would finish in the bottom of the order and he's just stronger and stronger and, um, just been amazing. And again, That's taught awesome. me so much. And then I've got my newest border collie who's three. So the first time I've repeated a breed. Mm hmm. But uh, first time I've had a female and she's learning desk, uh, presenting. Every dog gives you new challenges. You know, I really was hoping she'd take up uh, where Thorpe left off. Um, She is amazing. She's powerful. Uh, She's phenomenal at agility, but not so much my sport these days. Um, She'd be a phenomenal herding. We did a little bit with her. I'm not interested. Uh, I know the breeder was disappointed. She comes from great herding lines and they were very impressed with her. Uh, But disc was my thing. She's doing freestyle 
She's phenomenal at obedience, which I do with all my dogs. Uh, so she's been very successful there. Is she your first puppy too? She is my second. Second Thorpe puppy. Was my first. Oh, Thorpe. Mm-hmm. Yes, yes. And then Texas. Uh, but and at disc um, in freestyle, she's amazing. Um, a little too strong and powerful, but she gets so much air. So she is the wow of Burke for sure, um, and she's quite. Um, good at that. I will be the one slowing her down in that one. Uh, but um, in when it comes to being 30 feet out and catching a disc, um, she can be great, just amazing. I can set up things and throw and she can jump things, go around things and catch. <clears throat> um, unbelievable coordination. But if it's just an open field, she gets fixated. Okay. Her, her, she's so intense. She just loses control of her body and just disc and just sort of jumps, not necessarily even close to the disc at times. Um, so I, it's been a challenge. First, a frustration. You know, Carol loves usually, a good challenge. Yeah. So <laughs> I went through the frustration. This is just so... And I was getting a little annoyed when we played. And I said, I need a break. And then now I've got different strategies and I have a friend that works with me. And it's we're going to work very different strategies to – because with her, it's not about teaching her to catch or collect. It's teaching her about how to be thoughtful when she's – 50 feet away from yeah. you. So. Yeah, and that is a challenge. I'm sure you have like the best blueprints for working through this challenge, and I can't wait to see you nail it down. I know you will. All righty. Well, I think that that was a fabulous episode. Swanee, yes, anything yep. you wanted to say to wrap up? Well, I think uh, the next time uh, we're with Carol, we should bring a picture of margaritas because I want to see Carol dance. Oh, oh no, yeah. No. She said no dancing, but I think the power <laughs> of the margarita will help. How many margaritas will it take? Oh, way too many. I'd never, I'd pass out first. Actually, even my last freestyle run I shared with you guys with Texas was pretty out there for me. You know, um, I know, uh, you know, just doing a spin while she's doing, uh, you know, doing her uh, show of hands. And so that I can show she can hold that and adding motion. Even that is a little out there for me. So dancing. <laughs> oh my goodness. Oh, we'll get some beat going. We'll get some yes. hips moving. We'll get this nailed down. Carol, I want to thank you so much for joining us on this podcast. And we barely scraped the surface of the interesting life that is Carol. So I know we will have you back on again. Again, if you wanted to learn about DISC from a real champion and a real pro and a, a heck of a great instructor, you are thank so you. good at teaching. Join us for that. Um, there's audit spots still available in your seminar, and we would love to see you out there. And on that note, I'm Instructor Shannon. I'm Instructor Swanee. And we had Instructor Carol. (laughs) Happy training. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the McCann Dogs podcast. And if you'd like some more training resources, be sure to check us out on YouTube, Instagram, and Facebook at McCann Dogs. And if you'd like to train with us online, be sure to check out the show notes below for our My Dog Can online training program, where we know in just a few weeks, your dog will become a well-behaved family member. Until then, happy training.